Okay, I guess we'll get started. Uh, welcome all. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, this uh, conference is a somewhat of a follow-up on a conference we had in Paris earlier the, in this year in March. Uh, we did it on what could be included in a written uh, Scottish constitution to bring about certain uh, desired characteristics, uh, including a more democratic system, a more a more um, a more rights, and uh, a, you know just a, a better system for for Scotland truly under upon independence to be able to live under a much more effective system than they currently uh, enjoy, if that's the right word. So um, what I'd like to do first of all is uh, 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 play you the short video of Alan Smith. He unfortunately was not able to be uh, here this evening, uh, and then I will. Uh, then I will do my uh, in, in my intervention on uh, the the means in which uh, well, sort of sketching out a way in the, the sort of the way in which um, a constitution would be created to to have as just a society uh, as possible. Uh, then Elliot, I believe, will be talking about ways in which rights can be applied. Is that a, mm -hmm. that a good Probably. way? Of, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then Neil will be speaking about um, uh, uh, labor rights, and then Al, um, sorry, uh, John will be talking about uh, uh, geopolitical and defense issues within an independent uh, Scotland. So without further ado, let me play the brief uh, three-minute um, video from uh, Alan Smith, after which I will do my intervention. Sorry, can you tell me who you all are and, and what positions you are? Oh. Because I don't know any of you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my name is Mark McNaught. I am a, uh, I'm, a prof I'm, I'm an associate professor of American civilization in Rennes, in Rennes, France. Uh, I also do, do classes at Sciences Po Paris in, uh, in, in American constitutional law. Uh, about a year and a half ago when I found out that there would be a referendum, I, was, I began to think to myself and say, wow, wouldn't it be really, it, the, Scotland has such an amazing opportunity mm -hmm. to refound, to recast its institutions. And uh, so basically what I did to make a very long story short, I wrote a few letters to all of the members of the Scottish Parliament, sort of uh, about three or four letters making arguments on behalf of a, constitu of a written constitution. A lot of them were ignored, but I got enough, back enough to, um, and uh, uh, one of the uh, MSPs put me in touch with Elliot. I got in touch with Elliot, and then we began working <coughs> together and with this, the Constitutional Commission. I came over about a year ago uh, and had a meeting with, uh, with the Constitutional Commission and uh, asked how I could be of service. And I have been, since then, I've been both writing a regular column in Newsnet as well as, uh, as, as, well as um, uh, organizing the, the conference in March in Paris and, and, and in part, part this one as well. So uh, uh, I'm American of origin. My father uh, was born in Scotland, has lived there since the 1960s, but I certainly have had a, obviously a great affection for Scotland and really want to, if I can play any part in making something really amazing happen, I, I, I welcome the opportunity. Um, Hi, uh, my name is Elliot Bulmer. Uh, don't be put off by the accent. Uh, it, it reveals nothing about my sense of, of, of civic identity, um, other than the fact that I went to school in England. Um, I'm the research director of the Constitutional Commission, a position I've held since 2009. Um, the Constitutional Commission is a charity for constitutional education and research. My own academic background is in constitutional design and a little bit of constitutional theory um, and I see our role pretty much as to try and help bring light into what is otherwise a very heated debate. Hello everybody, <clears throat> my name is uh, John McDonald, uh, I'm a, an academic uh, um, specialising I suppose really my mind in fields of interest are kind of uh, security military affairs. Um, I lectured for years at the University of Dundee, my most recent um, lectures, uh, lecturing positions at Glasgow. I'm currently a lecturer without a portfolio. <laughs> um, I'm involved in several uh, projects related <coughs> to an examination of uh, my possible defence and security footprint for independent Scotland. Um, one of them being, of course, this, this very engaging project that we're discussing now. I'm Neil Davidson. I lecture in sociology at Glasgow University. I've uh, written a couple of books on Scottish history, the origins of Scottish nationhood, and discovering the Scottish Revolution. And I was supported for a radical independence campaign. Am I allowed to applaud at that bit? Yeah. 
So let me let me proceed. Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to the Turn uh, offices of the European Parliament in Edinburgh. Uh, you're very, very welcome to Scotland. I'm afraid uh, I'm myself unable to be with you this evening uh, because uh, this uh, conference of yours has uh, coincided with uh, what's probably going to be the busiest week of the parliamentary session. Uh, over in Brussels, we've got uh, CAP talks, uh, Common Agricultural Policy, which I've been very closely involved with as part of the negotiating team. Uh, we might be getting to an agreement this week. Uh, we've also got the EU budget talks, which uh, signing off 960 billion uh, euros worth of expenditure, which is taking a bit of time, as you can imagine. And we've also got uh, EU Sustainable Energy Week in Brussels this week, where obviously being Scottish, we do energy. And I'm hosting a number of events uh, for our Scottish uh, organisations and companies uh, leading the way in our green renewable revolution. So sadly, I'm afraid I can't be with you tonight, but uh, I am gutted to be missing your discussion. I very much enjoyed the, the chat that we had uh, in uh, Sciences Po uh, back uh, a few months back in Paris. And it really is absolutely fundamental to what we're going to do in next year's referendum campaign and uh, beyond that, what you're discussing tonight. Uh, the, the issues you're discussing in terms of uh, the, <coughs> forgive me, the comparison of other jurisdictions, uh, the social and cultural rights and how we'll enshrine them in a written constitution, uh, workers' rights, environmental rights, and also uh, military issues, and how we're going to put constraints upon the use of force on an ethical basis in an independent Scotland. Uh, we are absolutely uh, resolute that we will be a non-nuclear country, but we will have military matters dealt with in our constitution. So a fascinating discussion that you're having tonight. And it might be a minority sport, but I, and I, I think there's a wider audience for this than perhaps we sometimes give ourselves credit for. I think the people of Scotland are up for this discussion. And what sort of discussion are we having other than how are we going to set the basic law, the rule book, the guidebook for what sort of country we're trying to build here? In order to do that, you've got to have discussion about what our values actually are. I know what I think they are, but let's see what we as Scotland think about that process. Let's see what sort of rules and regulations we want to put down in the basic law of an independent Scotland about what sort of country we want to build and how we want to interact with the rest of the world. So I am sorry to be missing your discussions tonight, but it is absolutely fundamental. I very much look forward to reading the submissions and uh, watching the presentations. Uh, they'll be happening otherwise. Uh, I do wish you well with your efforts. Uh, this is an ongoing discussion because the fact is we need to win the referendum because otherwise we don't get to complete the discussions that you're actually starting. But it is so important that you are bringing that best practice from around the world to Scotland to inform our discussions. And I do wish you the very, very best in your efforts. You're all very welcome to Edinburgh. Let's keep this conversation going. Thanks very much. So first of all, I'd like to speak about, uh, about the ways in which rights ha are uh, assured in the United States. I, you know, I grew up in the United States, I teach U.S. constitutional law, and I'd like to use that as a reference point for what, both what does work, but also what doesn't work so well, and how in an independent Scotland certain constitutional mechanisms could be instituted to make laws much, much more guaranteed than they are in many cases uh, in the United States. So uh, I'd like to first begin a little bit historically about uh, talking a little bit about the Bill of Rights and how it came to be uh, applied because when the Bill of Rights in the United States was written back in 1791, it only applied to the federal government. So you had, of course, First Amendment, freedom of speech, uh, you know, the press, uh, Second Amendment, right to bear arms, uh, Fourth Amendment and through Eighth Amendment had to do with criminal procedure, search and seizure, right to right to a trial, all, all of these things. But as I mentioned before, the, the, at, especially throughout the 19th century and early 20th century, these rights within the Bill of Rights were only applied to uh, the federal government and not the states. And it wasn't until after the Civil War, with the Fourteenth Amendment, which guaranteed. Uh, due process and equal protection, that there was at least the, the mechanism whereby these rights could be applied uh, to the states. So beginning in the 1920s, we, uh, so only less than 100 years ago, we begin to see the application of rights 
within uh, to the states. And we have, I, you know, I, I'm not going to go through all of the different cases, but for example, the Establishment Clause of Religion was applied in 1937 under the Everson decision. You had many, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, rulings over over freedom of speech uh, and 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 many others over criminal procedure, but it's still it's very much still in the process of being uh, applied uh, to the states and in constant reinterpretation uh, by the Supreme Court. And so um, now the, the now this has led to certain inadequacies uh, within the uh, uh, within uh, within it because we see that uh, and that. Um, the Constitution is silent or very vague on many aspects which are very important to the functioning of the government. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, voting rights. Voting rights are uh, left to the states. Okay, so if you, in, in the United States, it says that all uh, you know, the states have the right to, hold, to determine the time, place, and manner of elections. So now, when you think about, and, and back in 1770, you know, during the 1770s, 1780s, you had, for example, the, uh, the uh, in, so the, the constitutions of the states determined who could vote. And for example, in South Carolina, you had to be a white landowning male who believed in the, uh, the, the, the a system of, of eternal rewards and punishments and believed in God and have a certain monetary value uh, in order to vote. And so th those were the only people who were allowed uh, to vote. Uh, and it wasn't, uh, and, and so generally speaking, it was you know, male, you know, uh, white landowning males who were, who were voting in the elections, you know, up, you know, at, least, at least up until the, the Civil War. Post Civil War, you had, for example, the uh, of the you know the the, uh, the 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 16th Amendment, which guaranteed that that voting could not be denied on the basis of race or you know, a previous condition of servitude. But you still had, of course, you know, during Reconstruction and you know for you know uh, really up until the, uh, the the Civil Rights Act, the Civil the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. You had, you know, it was, you know, a certainly mo uh, uh, blacks in the South were completely prevented from voting. Women began to get the right to vote in the late 19th century and were finally given by, and, and several states adopted women's suffrage before 1920 when the, 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 20, when the 19th Amendment was ultimately ratified in which voting could not be denied on the basis of, uh, of sex, uh, of gender. So, um, and, but and 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 uh, but it's still, again, many uh, you know many blacks in the South were prevented from voting. So, um, and it wasn't until the Civil Rights Act of 1965 that uh, that you know that that uh, there was, and they and the Southern states des designed many mechanisms to keep them voting. You had, for example, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, and all these other state level laws that would that had the effect of keeping people from voting. Uh, fine, and um, and then then there was the 1965 Civil Rights Act that did broadly, uh, uh, you know, br broaden enfranchisement quite a bit. But even in the but just in the last couple of years, in many states, you have seen these laws which have tr sought to repress the vote, uh, voter ID, um, different uh, shutting, you know, stopping early voting, all of these things. And so it's it's one of these things that we we learn. In school, that learn that voting is a right. You know that everybody has the right to vote, and, every, and, and but in reality, it's a very fragile right, and and it and it, it's you know it's not enshrined in a way that it could be that would really guarantee broad uh, you know uh, universal uh, uh, electoral participation. Um, another one is uh, parliamentary rules, and this has led you know uh, and. And uh, as well, and the Constitution also gives the House and the Senate the right to establish their own rules. Now, this has had the effect over time, and you know, it, the Congress has worked better or worse over the years. But at this point, we see that it is practically paralyzed. I mean, in the Senate, you have the the um, you know the, the filibuster, which requires 60 votes for anything to happen. You have the House, the, you have the you know the, the House, which is having great difficulty passing anything. And which has led to, as I said, a, a real paralysis of the of the of, of the electoral process, um, and also in addition to that, agencies which are supposed to assure these rights 
have, have been weakened uh, or defanged, if you will, uh, and the Supreme Court has played an important role in making it more difficult for the regulatory, uh, 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 the regulatory um, uh, offices to, to operate properly. Uh, for example, with uh, workers' rights, you have, you've had many uh, decisions recently by the, by the Supreme Court that make, it, that make it harder to form a union, harder to uh, bring suit against uh, an employer for discrimination, these types of things. And, and, the, and the agencies which are supposed to assure this, like the Equal, and, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, <coughs> which is supposed to oversee you know, uh, anti-discrimination ones, are virtually ineffective. I mean, they, they, you know, if you are discriminated against and you want to file suit, it's, it's not worth it. Uh, it's not worth the money, especially if it's a you know a minimum wage job. There's just no realistic recourse for uh, for many of these uh, uh, these things like discrimination, which are supposed to be prohibited uh, by the law. So, w so I think what the broader lesson in this is that these social struggles are never definitively won. We were still, you know, the Americans are still fighting over the same things over and over and over again. We thought, you know, we thought, okay, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, yay, you know, everybody has the right to vote. And then the states, because they do have the right to, to control, the, you know, to, to determine it within the constraints under it, they find other ways to get around that and to keep certain populations of the, uh, certain sectors of the population from voting. And so, uh, and so um, the question becomes, how could a written Scottish constitution be really hardwired to assure individual rights and liberties? You know, what could be put in a, a constitution that would definitively, I mean, you know, of course there will always be conflict in society, but that, that Scots in the future don't have to fight over the right to vote. They don't have to fight over, uh, you know, and, and the, and the, and the uh, parliament can work properly, and that the parliament, for example, is, is not, it doesn't set their own rules, but the rules are set, the, the, the political rules are set by some other entity. Now, um, I don't, uh, so I have a list of uh, a, a list of factors that are, you know, ideas that I, you know, that I've been, you know, dwelling over for quite some time and since I began to, since, you know, certainly since I uh, began really thinking about this, is I've, had, I've been virtually consumed by it, just thinking, you know, how could, you know, how could we avoid this, how could we, we avoid that? And I think um, the, one of the first things is to, in, uh, one of the first things in a written constitution would be to enshrine popular sovereignty as the sole basis for legitimacy. I mean, every state has to have some basis of legitimacy. And, you know, in many states, you know, you have different, you know, for example, sometimes it's religion, sometimes it's, you know, uh, other things, but I think it would be really important to simplify this as much as possible and to just say, it's the people, that's it, let's have, you know, the people be the sovereign, and they decide, they, they choose the government, and, uh, and not complicated by having a lot of other kind of sources or bases of uh, legitimacy. And this can be done in a way that, the, so the, the rights are enshrined in the Constitution from the beginning, so that, as I said, so that, we, that, that Scots in the future can avoid uh, many of the conflicts that over basic rights that, again, in the United States are still being played out. Uh, are you know still fighting over voting rights? Still, workers' rights uh, are are very fragile, and you know in many states, you know the, uh, collective bargaining has been decimated by different uh, legislatures and governors. And so it's it's you know for someone who has a progressive point of view, it's you know it's very hard to look positively into the future. And if there was a way of again just enshrining that everyone is you know everyone is equal before the law everyone has the same rights, uh, that this would go a long way towards, you know, you can't do everything but it, with, with these principles, but it's where you start. And where in, and over time, where, and, uh, and, and to, in, in, if there's ways in which, you know, once these rights are secured, that they cannot be uh, weakened or uh, revoked. Um, I, so I think, first of all, uh, one of the a very important thing, and I don't know how this will play out in negotiations over a constitution, but I, my my own view is that I think that that, that Scotland should be disestablished. It should not have any kind of official religion. 
I mean, I know that the Church of Scotland obviously has played an important role, and all religions should have the total, absolute right to practice as they choose. But I think if you look at, I mean, if you look at things within the UK government, if you look, for example, at the at the at the uh, the, 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 the the Queen's coronation oath, in the in in the Queen's coronation oath, she swears to uphold uh, the Protestant religion, and so in the the vow that she takes, she is vowing to uphold one religion over another. And the queen is the basis of the legitimacy of the British state. And so, uh, again, I, uh, I think that the, you know, the, 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 there should be, the, 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 that an independent Scotland should be you know, secular, disestablished, however, with an absolute freedom of religion, uh, provided that the laws are applied equally to all. What we see in the US is that there's been ways in which the, the kind of different spheres of laws, there's a lot of you know, tax exemptions and tax loopholes and all these others uh, given to different religions to the point where religions run businesses like restaurants or, you know, or, uh, or uh, you know, they build uh, you know, housing developments and they don't have to abide by the same taxes and regulations as their secular Counterparts, and I think that you know. Uh, again, I think that every, of course everybody should have the universal right to practice religion as they choose, but they all must be you know treated equally with you know uh, under under the law, and that all, and also that you know there be no differentiation between, for example, the treatment under the law of the clergy and everyone else, and we see how bad that can go when we see things like the pedophile scandal that's, in, you know, that's affected so many nations over the past uh, few years. So that everyone lives under the same law uh, very, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, without any exceptions. Um, another thing that would be, uh, I've, I've thought a lot about this and I don't know how this is done ultimately, but provisions within a constitution to go towards the elimination of sectarian conflict. And I, I understand that you know the, the, the you know the, the, it's not what it was before. It's not maybe as violent as it has been in Northern Ireland, but you still have a, a pretty strong you know Catholic Protestant you know um, conflict. You know, and it doesn't play out in the same way. It's not religious. Maybe it just plays out in you know during you know Rangers football game, Rangers Celtic football games. But it's still there, and I know that the Scottish, you know, government is taking, you know, means, for example, suppressing certain very, in, you know, insightful songs, this type of thing. But I'm, but I think that um, it's important to, again, uh, you know, uh, to, to, you know, put in a constitution the desirability and the and that the, that the that ultimately the. Um, the, 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 the parliament is obliged under the constitution to work towards the, the, the reduction and hopefully ultimately the elimination of sectarian conflict. But again, I can't predict how that would play, uh, how that would play out. Another one is the, um, would be in order to, again, guarantee equality under the law would be A, the ab abolition of aristocratic privilege within, the, 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 uh, within, the, uh, within any th affairs of the state. The, those who are lords and this type of thing are welcome to keep their titles for themselves, but it should not play any role in whether they get into, say, the House of Lords. I'm not suggesting they have a House of Lords for, uh, for an independent Scotland, but that they are simply, you know, they, they have their titles, that's fine, but it, it doesn't confer on them any status that people, that anybody else has just by nature of being a citizen. You know, I think the citizen, being a citizen, should be the, the, the you know, the equal and ultimate status within society. And I just don't think that there's much of a role for, uh, you know, these feudal uh, institutions that have faded but are still there and uh, still, again, of course, within the UK context, still still play uh, a role at least in the House of Lords. Um, Another thing, you know, and this is one of the, the things is going to be very tricky, but the uh, but the ultimate the ultimate replacement of the the monarch as the head of state with an elected monarch, and I think that at least initially, probably to get through the uh, the referendum process, that that maybe Queen Elizabeth will need to be kept on, you know, uh, through through that. However. For uh, one idea I had was to put into a written constitution, once Queen Elizabeth's reign 
comes to an end, that there be a referendum uh, within Scotland to decide whether or not they wish to have Charles or whoever to be king or to be to, to be the head of state, or that they choose that there's a new way. Maybe you know there's different models for that. Ireland is one example where the president has a relatively limited role. Uh, you know, doesn't. Uh, but that I. But again, this the, having the head of state, a hereditary head of state that whose role is ambiguous to say the least. Um, I think I don't think that have, has much place, and I don't think that Scotland wants to go into the future, that you know, the indefinite future, with the monarchy as the head of state. I just don't think it has much place in the world today. People are welcome to admire the queen or the monarch. You know, she'll still be in the magazines and all that. So, but that doesn't mean just because she's popular or just because her successors may be popular and interesting to, to watch and follow by certain, that doesn't mean she needs that they need to be head of state in an independent Scotland. Um, another, uh, I think, interesting idea would be uh, mandatory voting uh, with the automatic universal conscription for all 16-year-olds. Uh, this um, th this is done in Australia and it works pretty well. Uh, I I had some Australian students and they say yeah it works well and you do not see uh, you know uh, riots over the, in the streets in Australia over we were being forced to vote. You know you don't see them protesting having to vote and it works quite well uh, from what I understand. Maybe there's a little fine of twenty pounds or something like that for for not voting. You're not, you're not thrown in jail over it, but you know it, there's a certain incentive. Uh, maybe you could have a fine, and as long as you vote in the next few elections, that fine could be gotten rid of, something like that. But something where you know the people are uh, required to vote, and I think that that would go a very long way to reducing cynicism, and above all, having the government that's actually chosen by the people. Uh, I mean, I think one of the you know one of the things I hear most from Scott you know so much from Scots about the present system is that they Scotland has not since not since the, in the post-war period Scottish votes have not affected who has the majority in Parliament and and so many you know sometimes it's with you know sometimes it's with it sometimes it's not mostly with Labour but you know why not have a system where again everybody everybody has to vote. Uh, every, and it's the civic duty to vote, and uh, once they choose it, you know that that's what Scots chose, for better or for worse. If they do bad, you can get them out the next election, but it's truly something that people choose, and, and it, you know, uh, it comes, uh, comes what may. Um, another thing, especially coming from the United States, is the, uh, is the utmost importance of having a publicly funded, low-cost, um, high-tech campaign finance system. I cannot I, now. In, I know that you know it's 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 different in, in Great Britain. I realize that you don't have you know a campaign commercials on TV in the same way you do here. If you're running for the in the United States, if you're running for the Senate, if you're not ph phenomenally wealthy yourself, you have to raise millions of dollars to be even remotely competitive. And uh, now you have these you know these super PACs and these other outside groups, and it's just an absolute mess. And if if there was a way in which the elections could be done through, you know, it could be, for example, there would be a, a website that would have all the elections on it. So, for example, if you were in a certain constituency and you were trying to decide who to vote for, you could click on the, you know, the candidate. You could have, you know, videos. You could have debates between them. You could have letters uh, from constituents saying how wonderful or the person is or the feedback from the constituents so that people can go to a, a neutral place see what the pros and cons of each candidate are and, and choose accordingly, rather than having it be this battle of TV commercials that, that, that raises cynicism to the roof and has more the effect of depressing turnout just because people are so utterly disgusted with the process. And if it was a way of simplifying it and keeping it low, low expensive so that, so, that the, so that the candidates don't have to raise money. They should be serving their constituents. They shouldn't be on the phone to some, you know, plutocrat trying to get enough money for the next campaign. So that, I think that's very important. And I, and I, and I understand if it's, you know, it's not like the United States here, and it's in a position where if these constitutional provisions were, were, were imp applied from the, from the beginning, that it could really pave a way towards a very, a much more democratic uh, future. Um, uh, I also think that, that liberties do need to be, can, in certain cases, 
do need to be limited in certain, can be limited in certain ways. And I'm thinking specifically about the freedom of speech. Now, um, every, you know, everybody, you know, should have, you know, of course, have, should have the freedom of speech within a certain, uh, you know, within the confines of decency and and, uh, and 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 truth. But you know, again, looking at the United States, when you the, the recent decision over the Westboro Baptist Church, where you had these these uh, protesters, these maniacal protest religious protesters, you know, going to you know uh, going up with signs like you know God hates fags and stuff like that. And you know, protesting at military funerals, I you know, and the the Supreme Court said, well, you know, it's First Amendment. You know, I I just think that there should be more of a balance between you know the the right to speak, but also the right to be you know protected from truly hurtful, hateful speech. And so I think you know uh, you know again, I don't know how that would play out um, ultimately. Uh, another one, another thing that I think is very important is that the legal system be simple and accessible to all, and that uh, and that the way that the law is constructed, I think both in, in in the UK and in the US, is that you have this sort of morass of different laws passed in different years, and sometimes when you read the laws, it's just incredible because you say like you know uh, one clause might be, and in this law change the word and to if. Or something like that, where you, it, so you're reading it, you have no idea what it says on the law, and you have to go to the other law and sort of piece it together to try to have an idea of what it means, and that's what you pay a lawyer for. You know, a lawyer will take these laws and try to put it in a way that makes his case, that, you know, to, to make the case that that, that, they, that they that they need to make. And I think that it, you you know, uh, laws could be uh, you know constructed in a way where there was a corpus, anybody could go online and find out you know about you know different laws, click, they could read it themselves, and and and, and it must be written in an understandable language where you can you know you you anybody anybody can read it and understand it. I mean, why is it that a law, that there are laws written where, you know, you, you say, hey, uh, Mr. Lawyer, can you explain this to me? And they're like, no. You know, uh, they can't explain it themselves because it's written in such a vague, ob obscure way. And again, that just, you know, so you have to hire more lawyers to try to argue one way or the other. And so if you had a system that was clear, comprehensible, accessible to all, and modifiable as a, as a, as a, as a, as a core of law, uh, you know that would go a long way towards again just everybody being not having this immense differential. I think in both 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 in the U.S. and U.K. If you have money, you can get justice. If you don't, you can't. You know uh, broadly you know broadly speaking. So I think I think that that's very important to to, to promoting a more egalitarian society as well. Uh, another one is uh, total transparency in all state affairs. We're in an age now. We got the internet. We got the NSA <laughs> looking at us. Uh, we've got a lot of, you know, uh, we can't, you know, even in our daily lives with our cell phones, we can't, there's a, you know, there's a, we, there's, is no expectation or very little expectation of privacy. And I think that, you know, I mean, you know, maybe that all, ex, you know, all expenses of all candidates are put online. You can see, you know, exactly where everything came from. Uh, and just have it out there because if they don't, you know, if it's not and it's you know hidden somewhere and then it's kind of find out later, I mean, you know, it, it's you know it, people can get away with um, you know with with the serious corruption even before they found out or they never found out. Just have it all be transparent. Every expense, every budget, <clears throat> completely there. Anybody can go online and look at it and find out what where the money's being spent, what's being done, so they know what their government is doing. And it's transparent. And if, if someone sees something that they don't like, they can go and, and try to and try to resolve it, rather than it have it being uh, being hidden. Um, uh, and then finally, um, I I don't again I don't know how this would bear out, but a way of creating some kind of commission. Now the question often is, well, should should the, should an independent Scotland have a second chamber? And that's a, 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 certainly a debate to be had. But one of the one of the at least theoretical uses of a second chamber is to serve as a, as a check on the first to make sure that you know the house makes sure the senate can't go you know can't do anything too radical the house of lords on a good day is supposed to decide you know to to, to make sure that the, the house of commons you know to, to filter to to, uh, um, to to go through the law but i think if there was some kind of commission of of nonpartisan Chosen by all of the parties, you know, where they have to get a, maybe they, a way of choosing where they can get they have to get a majority in each party 
for it to be, you know, uh, that that they could ha they could have a way where the, the, these this this commission would be like both kind of the 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 wise old person who can help lawmakers write good laws and do good policies, but also set the rules for the for the legislative process. I referenced before, you know, the the, 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 the you know the, the the American Senate that just can't reform itself. It, it it will never reform itself from within, and there and it would be really good to have some kind of commission that could tweak the you know where 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 legislative procedure is constitutional but maybe in a, in a way that's modifiable more easily than for example fundamental rights or something much more Im important so you know for example if there is a there's parliamentary you know the, you know the parliamentary procedure goes on and then the commission notices oh this rule it doesn't work very well there, there needs to be a way of of changing that so that it works better and so that you, we can get rid of the kinks. It's like software on your computer. You know, why would you want to run, you know, <coughs> Windows 1789 on your computer? Wouldn't you want to be able to update that software to make sure that it runs much more efficiently? And I think there are ways of doing that where you can have, again, some kind of commission or some kind of mechanism which can uh, rate, which can modify parliamentary procedure to make sure that it works, that it functions effectively over the long term, and that, that it's that it's changeable. That it's not static, and that, that it can adapt to the times and the moments. So and and uh, and and so and I think that you can have different levels of constitutional amendment. For example, procedure could be done by this commission and then put to a referendum of the people to, to approve it. Uh, and uh, or for uh, but you know for example more fundamental rights. I don't know freedom of speech could be much much more difficult to change. You know you could have different. You know it's it, you can innovate. I mean. Blank slate. It, it, it's amazing what is possible, and uh, and and so if if uh, so, I'm just I'm just throwing these ideas out. Now, by, by uh, I'm, I'm, of course myself, I'll you know um, I, I can't dictate this by any means, but it's just I really think that for me, again, coming from the United States, it, 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 it's such an amazing opportunity here. I mean, to re to uh, you know to create something innovative that really shows the world what is constitutionally possible, being able to take from all these different, you know, what works here, what doesn't work here, what, you know, and then, but also making it, you know, modifiable. Because, you know, again, the, the U.S. Constitution, for example, it's just, you know, I mean, it's, it's there, but, you know, and, but it's, it's it, it can't prevent the abuses that we see. It can't, it can't solidify rights enough to stop them from being challenged. And so, um, uh, so I think that I, you know, I just think that it, it, it's such an amazing opportunity, and it, and I think that once more Scots really realize that and become cognizant of that, that that will really help, you know, uh, the yes vote when people say, "Wow, we can do this. We don't have to live this way. We don't have to put up with this profound dysfunction that you know so people in so many countries are are undergoing." Of course, it's not just the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, finally, which I think will go well into what uh, Elliot will talk about, was the is the framing of uh, positive rights. Now, uh, negative rights are most of what I've spoken about, which is preventing state infringement on individual liberty. So, for example, freedom of speech is a negative right because it prevents the the, the, the state from prevent you know from you know from from infringing on your right on your ability to say what you want to say. But you also have positive rights, things like the right to housing, the right to an education, the right to these types of things. And so, um, and I've, I've, I know that both Alex Salmond and Nicholas Sturgeon have, have talked about, oh, well, we can, you know, we can end homelessness or we can put in a right to a house. And while that is an, a completely admirable goal and if, something that should be worked towards, it needs to be done in, a, in the right way. Because if you simply say, oh, everybody has the right to a house, or to a, to lodging, and there's nothing to back it up. You know, there's not the money. There's not the money allocated. Then, it, then it, then it's just words on paper, and 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 the, and the credibility of the Constitution will, will will suffer. And so, it's very important to again. I think Elliot will. Uh, I hope Elliot will expand on this. But how to make these types of positive rights maybe aspirational, where you put something in the Constitution like we, you know, the the, the Scottish government must work towards universal lodging and, and universal education. And, but do it in a way that where if you don't, if, if there is homelessness, 
that what happens if you have anybody who's homeless can go and sue the state because they don't have a house. That's where, you know, so again, it can be an aspirational thing, but it, but it, needs, it needs to be done in the right way so that the, the credibility of the Constitution and the rights are truly guaranteed and, you know, be able to be realistic about what, uh, about what is possible. But again, but, work, but, but at least having that constitutional obligation for the, for, the, for the state to work towards these ends like housing, education, et cetera. So thank you, and I will uh, put it over. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, I'll take over from here. Um, <clears throat> a lot of very interesting ideas there, some of which are profoundly radical and perhaps more radical than we at first realize. Um, to the point of where we may maybe suggesting such things as, as actually having a, a codified system of law, um, which would require a fundamental change to the, the Scottish legal system. Um, my, my wife comes from Catalonia and uh, was utterly horrified to discover that not only do we not have a constitution written down, but also lots of our laws are not written down either. And how can people live like this? And how do you know what your rights are? And how do you know wh where you stand? And how do you live in this, in this murky tension where you, 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 your laws are not written down in black and white? And it took her a long time to, 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 to accept that. So, uh, but you're right, we stand at, we stand at a, a historical precipice where there is a window of opportunity to create a different type of constitutional order and a different type of relationship between citizens and the state and citizens and one another. Um, and what I want to address in my uh, presentation today is a little bit about the state of the debate on these issues, uh, because in my Constitutional Commission role I go and I listen to various people and I, I hear different aspects of this debate and sometimes you wouldn't believe that these aspects of the debate are taking place in the same country in the same century. <laughs> Um, because on the one hand, there are people who are committed to a deeply radical restructuring of society and seeing the Constitution as a vehicle for doing that. And there are others who still think this is all a bit unnecessary, really, isn't it? And, and let's, not, let's, not, yeah, let's not rock the boat too much, and, and that maybe it's safer just not to bother and make it up as you go along. Um, and my argument is that actually the... The sensible approach probably lies somewhere between those extremes. I don't see the absence of a written constitution as a viable option for a new state created in the 21st century, which seeks to have itself taken seriously amongst other European democracies. Because if you don't have a written constitution, what you're essentially doing is you're giving unlimited power to the government of the day. And who wants to vote for that? Who wants to vote for a situation in which today's parliamentary majority can determine the rules under which they and their successors are then up for election. That, that, that's like saying you're having a game of football and every time one team has possession they get to rewrite, rewrite the rules. Um, so I think we need to sort of recap a little bit about th this question of what is a constitution, what is the constitution for, what is the purpose that a constitution is supposed to serve and how do we conceptualise the nature of a constitution. Um, what role does the Constitution play in the life of a state? And I think what I, I want to do, I'm summarising here a vast body of academic literature, some of which is incredibly dense and, and not very accessible. And I'm trying to combine it all down into two sort of major strands or approaches that I think can be contrasted usefully against each other. The first is what I might call a liberal procedural approach to constitutionalism. According to this approach, the Constitution exists to protect basic rights and to provide a framework within which democracy takes place. The Constitution does not necessarily prescribe substantive ends. It doesn't include within the Constitution a very thick or elaborate vision of what a good society looks like. And it rests upon a thin pre-commitment which says we're not going to necessarily agree even who we are or where we want to go or how we want to live or what our concept of the good is. But what we will agree 
is that there are certain fundamental rights which by historical experience we have, we have deemed to be valuable and there are certain democratic procedures and institutions through which we will structure our disagreements. And so we come up with a, with a constitution that is essentially a frame of government and a frame of rights. Now, this could be quite detailed in its framing work. There might be room within that concept of a constitution to be quite specific. You know, let's nail down what the procedure is for, for dissolving parliament. Let's nail down the circumstances in which you know, the first minister holds office. Do they have to be elected by an absolute majority of the parliament, a simple majority? Is the vote by an open or a closed ballot? These are all important procedural rules which remove ambiguity from the game of politics, but they don't prescribe substantive outcomes. They leave that to be politically determined. That's a liberal procedural approach to the Constitution. The other approach is what I might call a, a communal programmatic approach. This is where the Constitution goes beyond those procedural elements to try to define substantively the nature of the political community over which it, it, it sits. This, this type of constitution might prescribe certain programmatic goals. Yeah. The reduction of income inequality, the reduction of health inequality. These might be programmatically mandated in such a, a constitution. There might be more about the constitution as an icon of identity. It might say things about what it means to belong to that type of community. It might define identity in a way. And I think a lot of the difficulties that we have in navigating constitutional debates, because we don't have a constitution, we all have our ideas of what a constitution looks like, but we don't have a text that we can go back to as our starting point. We, we have sometimes quite muddled thinking about what a constitution is and what it's trying to achieve. Um, so uh, the debate gets polarized between those who, who are fully in favor of this communal programmatic constitution, generally from a, a left, left of center to radical left. It might be a green left or it might be a red left, but th they tend to come from that sort of radical perspective and they want to entrench these things in a constitution you occasionally get some people from very much the other side who want to establish a sort of libertarian programmatic approach. I haven't yet encountered that in a Scottish context, but I have it in other contexts. Um, so they're doing, doing that. Meanwhile, the value of the liberal procedural constitution is, is poorly understood. Um, even if you are going to have these, pro these programmatic provisions, you at least need to have your structural provisions in place and to have those as clear. Otherwise, all you're doing is writing a manifesto, or you're writing a statement of, of aims, or, 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 or a, a mission statement for a society. Um, and I'm not saying here that any of that's bad. I'm not saying here that the liberal procedural constitution is good, and that the, the communal programmatic constitution is bad. All I'm suggesting is that there are these two kind of conceptually different approaches and that we should be aware of that distinction to help us guide our thinking and, and, and to be aware of what it is we're trying to achieve when we do this. So to summarize this first part, I think you might want to think of these two approaches as the constitution in a liberal procedural sense is like a highway code. The interesting thing about the highway code is it doesn't tell you where to go. <laughs> it's full of rules about making sure you don't bump into other vehicles, but it, that, that doesn't tell you where to go. And that's a liberal proceduralist constitution. Where we go, we have a, lo a lovely debate about, and we argue about, and we protest about, and we vote about, etc. But it, it's not in the constitution. A communal programmatic constitution I think is more like a, a route map it tells you what your objective is and where you're going to go and how you're going to get there now 
this leads us into this question of positive and negative rights. <coughs> I think there is a general consensus that if, if we are to be a state and we are to have a constitutional foundation so that the state doesn't belong to the party in power but belongs to everybody, then there needs to be provision within that for entrenched fundamental rights. And I would argue that in practical terms, the scope of those rights is probably already determined by the European Convention. That, that for good or ill, um, and the European Convention on Human Rights was never intended to be used in this way, by the way. It was intended to be a backstop to sit behind national constitutions. Mm -hmm. But you know, we never quite got that far. So the, the European Convention, I think, will be the, the basis of fundamental rights. The question is, do we go beyond that to incorporate social, economic, and cultural rights? Well, certainly for those that, uh, that hold the idea of a, a communal programmatic constitution, that's axiomatic. And I've encountered many discussions where people have been adamant that a constitution, if a constitution doesn't provide for, um, I don't know, na name an issue that, that, that's important to somebody, but the, the right to a non-nuclear society. If it, doesn't, if it doesn't prescribe that, then I'm not interested. And I can understand that. Likewise, there are people who say that it must protect the right um, to uh, social chapter rights, in, you know, in terms of employment rights, etc. My approach to this is, is that actually these distinctions between what's negative and what's positive and what's socio-economic and cultural and what's fundamental are slightly arbitrary. And that in practice, you have a conversation about this and this is part of the constitution-making process. And that if there is a broad consensus around the inclusion of a particular right and it is feasible to make that right judicially enforceable, then there might be a good case for including that in the Constitution. And I think it's really interesting that uh, sitting here under a picture of Neil McCormick, Neil McCormick wrote the SNP's 2002 draft Constitution, and that included a set of <coughs> rights such as the right to housing, the right to education, the right to healthcare, framed in such a way that these rights were really obligations on Parliament, um, rather than individually enforceable rights, but they were there and they were present. And I think within the, the context of Scottish society and a, and, and a constitution-making process today, there is, I think, a relatively strong case for incorporating rights of that sort uh, in, in a constitution. But, and this is a big but, the constitution has to be for everyone, or at least for the vast majority. There's one way historically to ensure your constitution-making process will fail, and that is only to appeal to one ideological group. A strongly polarizing constitution will fail to win the respect of the people in such a way that it is seen as something superior to the government of the day and, and has <coughs> abiding force. <coughs> so we have to design a constitution in such a way that the the vegetarian and the carnivore, the fundamentalist and the, 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 the ardent atheist, the, the rich and the poor, the, uh, the socialist and the capitalist can live together under the framework of a constitution that enables them to, to argue out their respective claims and rights in a, in a political way under the, the constitutional framework. Um, <coughs> So the, the answer to the question of whether we should include socio-economic rights or not, as, as I see it at the moment, in the text of the Constitution is really a pragmatic one. And it really comes down to whether we want to or not, and whether there is a broad public consensus for that or not. And if there is, let's do it. And if there isn't, let's not force it. But, uh, and, uh, but this, this, is, this is often the case that the constitutions arrive at. I mean, I, I decide that there are these two categories of constitution 
approach to constitution making, but in practice, most of the constitutions that exist are a dirty, messy, heavily argued, hastily sometimes argued, fudge. Because you're dealing with real people in real situations, and you've got a country to run and a state to build, and you've got to put this thing together somehow. And so you often find that some constitutions are, are more of the liberal procedural type. The Dutch constitution would be a good example of that. The Norwegian constitution, to a certain extent. These are good democracies with a progressive reputation, but their constitutions are kind of more towards the liberal procedural side. There are others. Um, the French Constitution of the Fourth Republic, for example, which came down more on the kind of um, communal uh, programmatic side. Um, you could argue that the new Icelandic constitution, the one that was approved in the referendum but hasn't yet actually come into effect because it's been uh, stymied at the parliamentary stage, you could argue that that was trying to shift from a perfectly workable, and it's proven that it's workable, perfectly workable liberal procedural constitution to try and develop a slightly more communal programmatic constitution. And they failed in the process because they didn't bring the conservative half of society with them. Beautiful document. I mean, for someone who, who has a progressive soul, there's lots of stuff there to, to really like. But as a constitution building process, as a consensus building process, ultimately it doesn't seem to have worked. Um, so my point there is simply <coughs> that we have these two categories. In practice, what emerges will emerge from discussion and will probably include elements of both. And it will be, as in all these things, a compromise. I have one further thought, though, which might help us to, to think differently about the nature of this compromise. And it's this. I wonder whether we can <coughs> distinguish in our constitution building process between the constitution proper, which might err more on the liberal procedural side, a framework of government, a framework of basic rights. How does the first minister get chosen? What's the parliamentary term? What's the electoral system? How do you choose an ombudsman? How do you make sure a judge isn't arbitrarily dismissed? That goes into the constitution. These are rules, these are laws. Nobody looks at this stuff. It's boring, it's dry, it's for lawyers and civil servants and people like that. It's, it, it, you're glad it's there, but it's like the sewage system of your house, you know? <laughs> it's only if it goes wrong that you care about it. You're, you're glad that it's, it's like the foundations. It holds the thing up. It's important, it's relevant. You know, that's, that's the constitution proper. No one wants to talk about that. And actually, maybe a lot of that is, is kind of, we've done a lot of that work already in building institutions of the Scottish Parliament. I, I don't think there will be much call for changing the electoral system, for example. We've got a good electoral system. Let's just constitutionalise it and make sure that the government of the day can't change it arbitrarily. I think they might find broad agreement on those things. <coughs> I think we could probably sit down in this room tonight and thrash out the sort of things that we'd like to see in those constitution proper or liberal procedural elements of the constitution. We might disagree on some things. There might be some people who are you know, more in favour of a republic, more in favour of a monarchy, but we're probably going to agree that there's going to be a symbolic head of state, but that the parliamentary system will determine who actually governs. Um, we might disagree on whether there should be a second chamber or not, but the broad outlines I think we're going to find consensus on. It's these it's these communal programmatic parts where the disagreement lies. That's the bit that people argue about. And I wonder whether, and this is a wonder whether point rather than a I necessarily believe this to be true point, I wonder whether it might be possible to, to kind of separate those two conversations a little bit and to, to embed them in different processes and different documents. Maybe the, this idea of the vision, the the, the, the mission statement for the Scottish state, maybe that comes out from a different process, a more popular process, a more discursive process, a process that starts out with values and principles and leads to a statement, almost like a code of ethics for the state, and that that somehow sits 
above or alongside or underneath the Constitution proper. That that, that, that second document becomes a declaration, a charter, a national covenant, that's a good word, with all sorts of historical resonances. Um, and, and it sits alongside the kind of dry, boring procedural elements of the Constitution. So I, I leave that there just as a um, just as a a point of discussion really, as to how how these two processes sit together. Do they need to be integrated? I think they do need to be integrated. I would argue, and I think the Scottish government might have played this very well, this is my final point. I would argue that it might be wise to agree institutional procedural matters before agreeing or attempting to agree the values and principles matters. And I would, do, I would argue that and it's completely the opposite way around for how one might think to approach it. But I think then, at least if you've got the structures in place, at least if you know that every four years you're going to have an election, at least if you know that the judiciary is going to be independent and that there's going to be an auditor's office and an ombudsman and that these people can't just be arbitrarily dismissed by the government of the day, then you have the institutional framework within which you can have the discussion about values and the discussion about principles and the attempt to develop from that initial platform a much deeper constitutional consensus moving forward. So I think this idea of a two-stage process, as laid out in the Scottish Government's Scotland's Future paper, of having an interim constitutional platform, which is a structural liberal pro procedural constitution, entrenched to prevent the government of the day making up the rules as they go along, setting out the basic frameworks of, of the state, and providing within it elements of a process or a mechanism by which this discussion, this deeper discussion about who we are, what we do, that goes into perhaps a more covenant-based permanent constitution can take place. I think that might be a good way of proceeding. And I've probably gone way over time, but <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elliot. <laughs> okay, I'm going to speak about two union rights, uh, labour rights in, in Scotland. And I think I'll probably have the least to say about the actual constitution of anyone on this panel. If Scotland becomes independent uh, next year, or the vote goes for independence next year, it will eventually become, I think, the 199th state in the world, and the rest of the UK will become the 200th state in the world. Uh, unlike the last one uh, to enter the state system, South Sudan, uh, Scotland will be a highly developed industrial capitalist society, one of the oldest uh, industrial capitalist societies in the world. Now, it may seem a bit obvious and pointless to say it's a capital society, but I think that has to be a starting point. Uh, and I want to begin by thinking a bit about the state rather than thinking about the constitution, because I think that's actually quite fundamental to what I'm talking about here. There's three. One, um, which is one of the views held by extreme libertarians of both left and right, with anarchists and followers of Ayn Rand or extreme neoliberals and so on, is that the state is again a parasitic excrescence. It exists outside society, it's staffed by a bureaucratic class, a new class, we're all interested in themselves and our client groups, it should be done away with as far as possible. It's a thing in itself. And it's a fairly extreme view which very few people actually hold. The most popular view of the state is the kind of liberal pluralist one, which has some connections to what Elliot was saying in liberal pluralist constitutional views. And this is the idea that the state is a kind of ringmaster. It's a sort of holding ground for society and different competing forces and interest groups and countervailing powers uh, play their, out their role here too, the medium of, of political parties, but also political pressure and uh, campaigning and then so on. This is the most popular view of the state. Um, the third view of the state, the one to which I personally hold, is the Marxist one, which is that states are actually um, class states. They, they exist to mainly follow the interests of the ruling class of whatever society they happen to be in, feudal, slave, or capitalist in our case. This will not cease to be the case if Scotland becomes independent at some point in 2016. Will still be a capital state, it will be run in the interest of capital. Now, that doesn't mean the only thing states do is to serve the interests of capitalists. 
and obviously the NHS is not something that's particularly in the interests of the capitalist class, so you can make an argument about healthy workforce and so on. The Americans don't have it, and they're the most capitalist country in the world. So I mean, there are things that happen, the forums that give us benefits and so on, but that doesn't alter the fundamental nature of the state. Now, uh, states therefore do two things. On the one hand, you have to balance out between different capitalists themselves, and make sure they don't tear each other apart in the war of all against all and so on. Uh, they may not do this very effectively. Uh, the British state for the last 40 years has certainly given far more interest in power to financial capital than it has to industrial capital, to the detriment of most people think of the country as a whole. And it has, above all, to make the interests of the, cap of the capitalists win out over those of the working class and uh, the people who actually work for these people. That's the fundamental role of the place. Now, this is disguised, of course, with a lot of language about equality and citizenship and all the rest of it. This is essentially what happens. Now, if that is the case, then expecting an awful lot from a constitution, I think, is a mistake. Uh, from the point of view of trade unionists and, and of the left more generally, the labor movement more generally, what you would expect is a something in the constitution that would actually balance up or rebalance up the situation to give workers more of an advantage in the struggle that goes on between them and the employers and the state which represents, by and large, those employers. Now, when Margaret Thatcher got elected uh, in 1979 in this country, the beginning of what we tend to think of as the neoliberal period, which is still going on, unfortunately, and more or less carried on throughout the world until Reagan and until the Finnishy in Chile and so on. Um, and indeed carried on by Blair and New Labour in 1997 with some amendments, with essentially the same economic project, to marketise, deregulate, privatise and so on, as, as far as anything of these things could be done. Um, this was the beginning of a real shift in how capital was organising itself, um, in, in the first in the West and then throughout the rest of the world. And connected with that was a project of weakening trade union rights in a really serious onslaught that began in 1980, with the first of what were 10 pieces of legislation, employment acts and so on, and climaxing actually one under New Labour uh, early on in, in, in the Blair uh, <coughs> government, uh, containing 123 separate restrictions on the abilities of trade unions to actually take action and in positions of how they should run their affairs. I'll give you some of the highlights in case you're too young to experience this or have forgotten what they involve. The high point of trade union freedom, I suppose, in, the, in this country and the reaction to the members was in 1976. After that, things began to be downhill from my point of view. Uh, definition of lawful picketing restricted to your own place of work. 80% ballot required to legalise a closed shop. Code of practice involving six pickets alone and a picket line. That law, that law is still in place, incidentally. Next, two years later, employers today have junctions against unions and sue unions for damages. This is possibly the single most important piece of legislation of any of the pieces of legislation that passed against the unions that split by shortly, and so on. The unions to compensate members to split for non-compliance and majority decisions. Um, many, many more restrictions of where you can take action, where you can picket lines, and so on. Unions liable for action uh, induced by any official unless of written repudiation using statutory form of words sent to all members. Um, and so on. The potential after all these bits of legislation was to make it virtually impossible in some cases to take strike action. Um, it would certainly make it very difficult to effective strike action. Cooling off periods for your ballots, uh, you have to present a list of all your members in a particular workplace for you can have the ballot. Extremely difficult if you're in a workplace where people are changing quickly and, 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 and without necessarily being there for longer than a couple of months, and so on. The purpose of this was to weaken the trade union and labour movement and make it extremely difficult to take effective action, or in some cases, action at all. None of this was reversed by the new Labour government from 1997. In fact, it was added to uh, a couple years after they came into power. And Blair used to boast about how it was marvellous that we had the most restrictive trade union laws in the West. Only America actually has more restrictive trade union laws than Britain does. So part of the problem, of course, is that the successor states um, if the UK does break up will essentially inherit the laws that currently are on the statute book. We will to start off with a complete blank slate in terms of law. We will inherit all this. So there's a question of what attitude then do trade unionists take, or anybody who's sympathetic do trade unions have in terms of the legal situation, and in terms of what, what you want to put into a constitution. Now here I think it's a difficulty. Um, certainly there are things that I will give you what I think should go into the constitution shortly, but quite a lot of aspects of what trade unions should be doing, I think there should be silence um, from, from the constitution. There should be something that actually is not written down, and this is for reasons of, <laughs> this is reasons of, of supporting to unionism, and if you want specific laws dealing with specific issues, then they should be they should actually be argued out uh, in the parliament and passed, rather than being written into the constitution. So, what do we what do we want as part of it? Just one thing I was thinking about: people are saying Britain doesn't have a constitution. 
in a sense that was true, that it, over the last 10, 20 years, actually, there has been a kind of creeping constitutionalization from a number of different sources of the British Constitution. One, obviously, is the European law, uh, the Social Charter, and various other aspects of the EU law, which we, despite all the opt-outs, have to abide by. There's the process of judicial review, which is a piece of the being used, like referenda, which, you know, you know, not, were not part of the British constitutional settlement until very recently. Um, and but I think juridification, an endless enactment of laws to govern people's behavior, uh, which then have an impact on, on, on constitutional rights. So there is a kind of horrible thing being created on top of the underwritten constitution, a whole series of other things which would build into that. Again, some which would be inherited by a successor of Scottish state. I just mentioned that because there, there is some implications of that for what I'm going to talk about. Okay. So the first thing I think we would want to do um, is to abolish all of the bits of legislation that we passed this 1918, whose purpose was in fact to restrict the ability of trade unions to defend their members or to advance their cause, with the possible exception of those elements of the various employment acts which actually made it legally necessary to elect your general secretaries and executive councils on a fairly regular basis. I think most trade unionists now would accept that was a good idea and uh, would like to maintain that, that democratic power over how their unions are run. The rest of this, however, things I've learned in a period of 123, if you want, uh, would essentially have to go, putting us back to the position of the status quo ante um, for the, the, the anti trade laws being anti imposed. Okay, that's wiping the slate clean or almost coming up of what would happen. Then, I think what you want to write into the Constitution would be, first of all, that trade unions are recognised as institutions that have the right to exist, and so I think it's essential that's included there. Also, that they have the right to take industrial action, including and up to. Uh, the right to withdraw their labour, take strike action. Um, that the representatives of the union have a right to pay the time off to represent their members. This is currently under attack in the latest uh, uh, tranche of forthcoming uh, anti union law coalitions planning. And that unions have the right to organise their own democratic internal structures, and these are imposed outside by, <coughs> by the state. That's again a basic minimum, I think, of what you'd want in a constitution in terms of recognition. I don't think it would go beyond that. I think in terms of, for example, recognition for the purposes, well actually I think you do want recognition for the purposes of bargaining and negotiations, not just for con consultation. Consultation, as anyone who's ever worked for the state, as I have, still serving for 20 years, we know what consultation means. <coughs> and if you ask people, if you think of something, then you end up plan to do anyway, <laughs> after writing up a report saying this is what people said. No, we don't want the right to consultation, what you actually want is the right to negotiation and then collective bargaining, and this should be included, I think, in the Constitution as well. I am not for saying how many people you have to have, or percentage of people should you have before you get recognition. I think that's something that should be left silent uh, and should be fought out uh, in terms of the different workplaces and so on themselves. So that's, again, we're up four or five points in the Constitution, I think, should be encapsulated in that. The rest of it actually should be silent or should be argued out in terms of different legal enactments that are separate from the Constitution themselves. There are however, several things that we would argue for in connection with that. First, the, ju the de juridification of industrial relations as far as possible, uh, simplifying individual employment law, removing things like employment <coughs> tribunal chairs, and making decisions for lay people, which is what happens in France, <coughs> for example. Um, no opt-outs of the relevant EU legislation, and the enforcement of social rights and social charter, I think that's pretty, uh, and I agree with, with Elliot with this, but you have to be careful also. I mean, there's a lot of things in EU law which are, for example, insist on um, privatization or on competition between different areas and, and compulsory competition, for example, in terms of the NHS, this is a threat in England. Um, so you have to be careful with the EU, it's not a mixed blessing. And therefore, I think there has to be a quite serious discussion about exactly you know, to what extent we, we, we do simply accept everything in terms of the EU. It's not to our benefit. Um, some things, um, oh yes, a particular bugbear of mine, the NHS and the Health and Safety Inspector. Um, I was talking about how the state is generally you know, acts in the favour of employers. I mean, you do not <coughs> tend to get police breaking down the door of workplaces to make sure that health and safety law is being imposed. You do get police attacking picket lines if they're getting out of hand. Actually, the health and safety inspector needs to be strengthened, and this should be written in, I think, because one of the fundamental uh, aspects of, of what Scotland really wants is safe workplaces where people are, their arms are ripped off or whatever by, by machinery. And you know, a health and safety inspector is about 30 people or something currently through the entire country. This is something that could seriously be strengthened. Um, and things like standing rights for unfair dismissal, uh, for example, to make reinstatement the default position. Um, at present, I think it's 0 0.1 successful cases are actually reinstated. Uh, and in, in case of tribunal remedies to match actual losses suffered by workers, 
Um, so there's, there's a series of, of specific things that could be done to strengthen a constitutional position, which could be the starting point for the right to, to, for teams to exist and to have a set of abilities to defend their members. Just two things to conclude um, how this would benefit people in Scotland. Um, currently, one in ten people in the greater Glasgow area works in a call centre or some really particular uh, employment situation. That is far, far more than ever worked in engineering or any of the great proletarian <coughs> occupations we tend to associate with the rest of Scotland. Most of these people, the overwhelming majority of these people, are not unionised, but they actually work in conditions which are just about as bad as some of the worst factory conditions of 30, 40, 50 years ago. They have to stick their hand up to go to the toilet, they're, they're endlessly you know, pressurised, answers, phone calls and so on. These people need to be unionised, and the law should exist, and the constitution should exist to allow it to happen. One thing that is often ignored, I think, missed about the anti tyranny <coughs> laws, they're not there to be, to be employed every opportunity. I've stood on many picket lines, both civil service and, um, and you know, university picket lines, where there have been 20, 25, 30, 40 people standing on the picket line, a clear breach of the law. Some of these people aren't even in our union, some of them have terrible left-wing organisations, some of them are students. Has anyone bothered? No. The reason <coughs> the laws exist is not to be implemented at every point. The laws exist to terrify trade union officials and scare them into obeying the law so they don't take action necessary to win. That's what they're for. They don't want their, their funds to be sequestrated or seized, they don't want to be sued and they don't want to go to jail. So actually that's why that's what they're there for. It's not, it's not a thing that every single thing you do will immediately bring these laws into place. So this is one of the reasons for getting rid of them. So this excuse no longer exists for not taking the necessary action. Finally, one other thing we might want to consider for the Constitution, something which exists in South African law, and this is called the right of expropriation. <coughs> this is, if we are a business or a company of some sort is actually taking action which is detrimental to the social good, there exists a law in South African law that says it can be expropriated on demand of its workforce. Now, we all need to think about the Royal Bank of Scotland. I think how useful this kind of law would actually have been uh, in Scotland in the, over the last five or six years when it led to the crash, given the kind of behaviour of these people. So there's plenty, I think, to think about here. A lot of it isn't actually specifically connected to the Constitution, but is linked to it and how it might be built and supported. But certainly, in a, in a world where classes are divided and in conflict with each other, this is one way of helping our side to NC, or the union side, in the coming stories. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Um, I, I genuinely believe that um, an independent Scotland will be a, a better global citizen. Um, I have no, no doubts in my mind about that, um, that it will act better um, in, in, in the world um, than the United Kingdom currently does. Um, why? Well, I, I think it's, it's quite obvious why. I think if um, Scots, uh, Scottish citizens do vote yes in next year's independence referendum, it will quite clearly be um, democratic voice making its, its will heard for change, for meaningful change from the status quo and change um, towards something better. If we examine the, the, the various narratives um, of, of, you know, in recent times within the pro-independence camp, uh, camp within, in, in, in Scotland, um, foreign policy and defence issues surface time after time after time. Um, we know that Scotland's housing with the British nuclear deterrent in its entirety um, has long caused disgruntlement amongst uh, uh, Scots and obviously many people beyond Scotland. And of course the post 9-11 period in particular has um, brought salt perhaps into old disgruntlements um, amongst many Scottish citizens. Um, we're all familiar with, by now, familiar beyond belief with a lot of the, the really dispiriting events which have happened um, post 9-11. Um, Iraq, Afghanistan continue obviously to, to, to dominate the news, but there are many other things, rendition, rising arms sales across the EU region, um, some would argue, um, increasing use of drones, the UK now being used as a remote, um, a remote base for drone operations. There are, across a, a range of different issues, um, a great many things which, if Scotland does vote yes next year, I think um, will change. If nothing else, it's, it's quite an intriguing kind of um, situation when we think about, you know, just mentioned EU membership, NATO membership. Um, it's very, very seldom um, in, in um, a, you know, a, a modern, developed liberal democracy actually having the chance to press reset on its engagement with the world. It's an absolutely staggering thing when you think about it. It just does not happen. So the opportunity, if a yes vote does happen, is incredibly exciting. Nothing else for the, the intellectual enjoyment of it. 
And for Scottish citizens, it obviously means something far, far more. It will allow us to press reset on a UK defence and foreign policy posture, which many Scots think takes Scotland to a place where Scotland does not want to be. Now, I'm going to look, there, there are obviously a whole pile of different issues we could look at when we're talking about um, how relevant a, a, a written constitution might be towards steering and guiding and importantly restraining Scotland's military posture. Um, and obviously we are kind of in, a, in, a, in a time of an increasingly complicated security environment, especially within the NATO region. I'm going to focus on, on, on two issues which, as I'm sure we're all aware, can consistently dominate the debates. I'm going to look at the issue of Trident. Um, and this, the, the, the question of whether Scotland can actually have its aspirations to be a nuclear weapons free zone met through the writing of a constitution. And also whether Scotland's conventional military activities, think of a lot of the stuff we've seen post 9 11, Iraq, Afghanistan, etc., whether a, a, a written constitution has anything to say, anything to do, which might stop some of the military excesses, some of the bad behaviour that we've seen. Um, since 9-11 um, in particular. Now, my answer to this as is a, is a, someone who's, who's long studied particularly kind of transatlantic security in NATO, my short answer to this is yes. In theory, a um, written constitution can, go up, can, can do an awful lot to help Scotland move towards uh, an international posture, if you like, which a great many Scottish citizens will prefer. But it goes without saying there are no guarantees um, and ultimately, I think it's important to note um, that you know, the, 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 the value, the strength of any Britain constitution it really is dependent upon the willingness of elites across government to actually adhere to the word, and very, very importantly, as I'll go to discuss in a wee minute, the spirit of that constitution. If Scotland votes yes, um, and is on the path of becoming a, an independent nation state, from a foreign policy, defence, security perspective, there will be two key issues which I think a, a written constitution will be key to addressing. First of, them, first of those is that um, Scotland will still obviously house nuclear weapons, um, a situation which I think despite a rather spurious uh, the poll I think con uh, conducted by the Conservatives, uh, a situation which the majority of Scots, I think I'm right in saying, are, are grossly unhappy with. That's the first situation. The second situation is, um, and I think this is very, very important, um, the second situation is that Scotland will find itself an independent Northern European state sitting in the very heart of the NATO region, a region which has seen an absolute burgeoning of both security agenda and security activity, particularly since 9-11. I, I, don't, I don't think it's kind of overstating it to say that um, this, this NATO region agenda, I'm not necessarily specifically referring to NATO, because as the recent popularity of so-called coalitions of the willing testify, a state doesn't have to be a NATO member to find itself being dragged into or politely asked to join military activities which many of its citizens may not agree with. Um, I don't think it's overstating it to say that if Scotland becomes independent, it will find itself um, in the middle of a kind of a, a raging security agenda which really does have massive centripetal forces um, we have dwindling military budgets, we have a kind of a growing sense within NATO that burden sharing is now the way to actually address many of the security concerns. And this ethos has prompted um, greater pressures, greater solicitations, even in militarily neutral European states, to actually get involved in various aspects of the security agenda. So we even see now a very, very curious, rather troubling situation, I would say, um, we, we, we now see militarily neutral or militarily non-aligned, if you prefer, states um, such as Ireland now having a, a military presence in Afghanistan. Um, we see recently um, Sweden and uh, Finland agreeing to police Icelandic airspace at NATO's request. Neither of those states a NATO member. Now, it would be naive in the, in the extreme to think that an independent Scotland will somehow be, be immune from these pressures to become involved. Naive in the extreme. Um, and while that I think there is a, a very, very strong voice of pacifism flowing through the, the, the narratives of, 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 of nationalism in Scotland, there are many other Scots um, who would welcome Scotland's involvement in international security agenda. Scotland does have, lest we forget, a very, very proud, a very rich um, military tradi uh, tradition some aspects perhaps worthy of more pride than others, I, 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 sh I should add. 
Um, and of course, the First Minister Alex Salmond um, at the Brookings Institute in Washington DC, I think in April, clearly said that if Scotland becomes independent, we still will try and relinquish nuclear weapons, but make no mistake, when it comes to security within the NATO region, Scotland will be a good neighbour. So taken together, I, I think we can assume that um, if Scotland is an independent nation state, Scotland will be militarily active. And if we look at those two issues, the issue of um, whether we can indeed rid ourselves of Trident, um, and if we maybe address the concerns that many Scottish citizens will have about precisely how milita militarily active and independent Scotland will be, it's here for me that I really do see the <coughs> values of our written constitution. Um, what I'm going to do is to, um, I've got about 55 pages here, it looks like Lord of the Rings, I apologise, I'm not going to discuss it all. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to really speak to, to, to specific um, constitutional articles um, is it specifically, we only have 20 minutes. What, I'm, what I've been doing, part of like a, a broader piece of work, <coughs> is looking at the, um, what we can learn from other states, from other examples, about what might actually inform the framers of a Scottish constitution in security and defence and foreign policy terms. Um, and there really are very, very illuminating lessons to be learned from other places. So I'm going to start off by looking at the, the, the issue of nuclear disarmament um, and this, this, this sense that many, many of us, I'm sure, feel that um, it would be wonderful to see Scotland emerging as an internationally recognised nuclear weapons-free zone. Um, in much of the discussion about, about you know, Scotland's ability to, to, you know, to, to get rid of Trident, um, parallels are often drawn, um, or examples, are often kind of often used are, are that of uh, New Zealand, which has um, had a very very interesting history, um, very very civic kind of generated um, resistance to nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. and obviously it really did get in the United States bad side when it eventually kind of announced itself formally as being a, a nuclear weapons free state. Um, but a, an example that I've looked at, which I, th I find particularly interesting as well, is that of Mongolia, which is maybe kind of, perhaps a kind of slightly less kind of probable example that, um, to, um, for, for those of you who maybe are, are used to hearing about New Zealand the New Zealand experience. Um, but the Mongolian experience, I think, um, really does <coughs> represent a, a, an example, an experience that the framers of a Scottish constitution could look to. Um, not only is it an example of good practice, but also of the, the importance of actually having we don't want nuclear weapons in this country enshrined in formal legislation. It makes a profound difference, as I, I, I hope I'll go on to show. So, um, nuclear weapons. Um, the whole thing with Trident, I think, they'll probably all agree, will be very, very messy indeed. And it's, 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 it's almost kind of futile to try and kind of um, preempt what will happen. I think all we can say in terms of how the Scottish Government actually could engage with the Trident issue, I think all we can say is that we hope it sticks by its guns. I think there's a very good chance that tremendous pressure will be brought to bear on the Scottish Government by Washington and by London, who unless things change dramatically between now and uh, 2016, will be very, very keen to maintain the Anglo-American nuclear status quo. And it will be most important that the Scottish Government shows courage and sticks to its, its, its intention of seeing um, nuclear weapons are illegal here enshrined in a constitution. The Mongolian experience, as I say, is, um, is, a, is, a, is a heartening one. Uh, between, after the end of the Cold War, between 1993 and 2000, Mongolia set in train a process when shrining legislation into, I always get this wrong, into what is now known as the Law of Mongolia and its Nuclear Weapon Free Status. Um, it was submitted um, on the 28th of February 2000 to the United Nations, formally declaring to the world Mongolia's wish not only to be rid of nuclear weapons, but also in various other passages to ban the develop development, manufacture or possession of any nuclear weapons in its soil, the testing or use of nuclear weapons, transportation, even the temporary of nuclear weapons on Mongolian soil. A really, a, a really kind of vigorous um, enunciation to the world. <coughs> and this legislation, this law of Mongolia, really has continued to be the, the, the centre point for Mongolia's wishes and aspirations, successful aspirations as it, as it happens, to actually kind of further cement international recognition of its nuclear weapons free zone status. Um, in September 2012, five officially recognised nuclear weapon states actually signed a pledge at Mongolia's behest 
to respect, and I quote, to respect the nuclear weapons free status of Mongolia and not to contribute to any act that would violate it. Now, first and foremost, from a Scottish perspective, I think this is incredibly significant. First of all, it's a triumph um, in terms of what Mongolia wanted to do and has done successfully. Secondly, in signing this pledge, from a Scottish perspective, London and Washington have created a precedent. They have formally acknowledged legislatively bound state repudiations of nuclear weapons. And whilst the, the whole secession process and the discussions about Trident will be messy, I take great courage from the fact that having accepted Mongolia's legislative proclamation, I think they would find it almost impossibly hard to reject Scotland's. One other kind of thing, I suppose, which uh, merits kind of consideration, um, and I often kind of feel that I'm kind of putting the kibosh on um, optimism <laughs> when I raise this. Um, talk to kind of some people, and they, they seem to think that um, that um, trying nuclear weapons will be dumped at the border the day after a successful yes vote. It's not going to happen, um, and because of this, I don't know how common footnotes are and asterisks. Asterisks. Um, I think I that right. Whatever. Asterisks um, appear in constitutions. But um, I had an interesting discussion with, with John Ainsley, the director of uh, Scottish CND, about, about this um, in, in the last couple of weeks. And I think almost certainly we would have to be pragmatic in accepting that actually removing Trident, uh, physically removing Trident from Scotland, may take years, may take 10 years. However, that shouldn't necessarily kind of strike fear and dismay into the hearts of um, nuclear opponents in Scotland. Um, one thing which um, we, we, uh, we, we could look to do um, in a constitution is to actually acknowledge this, perhaps underneath the you know an article which expressly forbids the um, nuclear weapons in Scotland. We could, for, for example, and this is John Ainsley's note that he's made himself. This could perhaps could be a footnote in a uh, Scottish constitution. Stationing of nuclear weapons in Scotland's land and waters is prohibited. An exception shall be made for, for example, two years from the date when this constitution takes effect, during which time nuclear weapon, weapons may be stored in Scotland prior to their removal. During this period, all activity supporting the operational deployment of these weapons shall be prohibited. So, such a, an inclusion into a Scottish constitution, there won't be any concession to our aspiration to be a nuclear weapons free state. I think it would be a, a, a prudent acknowledgement of the fact that we will get there, perhaps just not as quickly as some of us would like. The key thing, as I said earlier on, is that the Scottish Government um, sticks to its guns. It doesn't bow to the pressures which I think will almost certainly emanate from London and from Washington, perhaps elsewhere, to try and stick with the status quo for some time longer. So there's one kind of brief examination uh, from certainly you know from from a security perspective of how a written constitution really can have an extremely positive impact on the international posture of an independent Scotland the second issue and one which um, obviously kind of does strike you know strike a lot of debate and a lot of kind of um, um, amongst them um, people when they think about the merits or demerits of independence is the issue of how a Scottish um, defense force will act how active it will be um, in, in the world and of course, perhaps this, this debate has been kind of strengthened, nourished somewhat um, by the SNP's uh, NATO U-turn late last year. It can seem to maybe reinvigorate concerns, perhaps, um, the, you know, the, the off-site kind of thing with the criticism of NATO that um, you know, Scottish forces will be dragged into US wars by virtue of NATO membership. Um, one response to that um, from the First Minister has been to articulate the, the need for a triple lock mechanism again, which I assume would be enshrined into a written constitution, a triple lock mechanism, which would ensure um, not that Scotland would get dragged into any reckless military activities, perhaps, that Washington might conjure. I'm painting a very, very negative picture here of Washington. I, I don't intend to. I'm, 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 I'm invoking the, 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 you know, the, 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 kind of the, the, the negatives. Um, but that um, even if Scotland were a NATO member, um, that this triple lock mechanism would effectively kind of stop any bad military behaviour from an independent Scotland. Now, the triple lock mechanism is effectively this. Um, it would mean a situation whereby if any deployment of Scottish forces were to occur, first of all, three mechanisms would have to be triggered. The Scottish Government would have to agree, majority agreement, that this deployment will go ahead. The second mechanism would be that the Scottish Parliament itself 
would have to vote in majority for the deployment to go ahead. The third mechanism that would have to be triggered would be that the United Nations would have to authorise the military you know, endeavour in question. Now, I think there's a lot of wisdom in having a triple lock mechanism um, effectively reining in any military largesse we may see from an independent Scotland. But once again, looking to the examples of other states, I think we have to be really careful even about that. An example of how a, you know, a triple lock, constitutional you know, triple lock, has really failed, in my view, in recent times, can be seen if we look across the, across the water, uh, that way, not that way, um, to Ireland. The Irish experience post 9-11 has been an incredibly interesting one. And more interesting still, because Ireland is seen by many people, and rightly so, I can understand why, to be almost a kind of a paragon of virtue in international politics terms. Um, it's militarily neutral, or militarily non-aligned, it's not a NATO member, it's a member of uh, the Partnership for Peace programme. And Ireland's military focus is, um, is, is narrow and benevolent. You know, it's um, focused on UN and EU humanitarian, humanitarian operations and peacekeeping operations. The Irish Constitution states that Ireland will not declare war, and any involvement in hostilities or warfighting operations must be voted on by the Irish DAL. And it also has this triple lock um, mechanism in place um, as a result of the 2006 Defence Amendment Act. Now, to all intents and purposes then, Ireland really is a model an independent Scotland might look to. It's a very responsible military actor. It looks very much to try and kind of have a military footprint which is used for good purposes. And of course, any military excess is effectively, in theory, um, headed off at the pass by this hierarchy of constitutional and statute law. But that has not happened in our own situation since the end of, since the, the, the beginning of the 9-11 period. And one example, which I think is important, and one example which I think demonstrates very, very vividly, and framers of a Scottish constitution bear this in mind, when we think often of military bad behaviour, we often think of physically placing our troops in some you know, illegitimate or you know, spurious or kind of questionable military conflict. But I think when we're thinking about um, how a, con a Scottish constitution should address the situation of a Scottish military fo footprint, we should remember that bad military behaviour can manifest itself in far more ways than sending Scottish forces to fight, kill and possibly die in a foreign battlefield. And the Irish example post 9-11 vividly demonstrates this. One of the things um, that Ireland has, has done in the post 9-11 period, and some of you, many of you may, may be aware of it, is allowed sh um, the, the, the US military, the use of Shannon Airport as a stopping point um, to, to, for, for troops to set down, to refuel, um, before heading off to various theatres of conflict throughout the world. Now, th th this has long happened. It, it comes as no surprise to anybody that Ireland and America have, you know, have, have a, you know, a, a, a strong and distinctive relationship. But under you know, <coughs> international neutrality rules, um, it was always the case that uh, many American forces landing in Shannon were unarmed. There was no mili active mat military materiel, as I understand it, allowed in planes, troops weren't carrying weapons, all that kind of stuff. Post 9-11, that has not happened. Um, and it's thought that up to 2 million US troops have passed through Shannon Airport um, since September the 11th, 2001. 2 million. Shannon Airport has also played host to CIA rendition flights, both for stop-off and for refueling. Um, and it's a curious situation when we look at Ireland's democratic, constitutionally protected credentials. Despite the fact that um, Irish involvement in military affairs, according to the constitution and statute law, should only come with UN endorsement, UN authorization. We know that the 2003 invasion of Iraq did not receive that endorsement. And yet I don't think it's overstating it to say that Ireland has been absolutely critical mm -hmm. to the prosecution of those conflicts. If Napoleon's off-sighted maxim that, you know, that an, an army marches in his stomach refers to the criticality of supply lines, I don't think it's overstating it to say that Ireland has been the umbilical cord for US warfighting operations across the Middle East and beyond post-2001. Now, why do I mention this? Well, I mention this because I think these things are incredibly important to bear in mind when we think about, firstly, what kind of nation we want Scotland to be, how we want Scotland to act in the world. 
Secondly, and we're talking about a constitution and how it might manifest itself, what it might look like, I think that we are torn in, a situ in, the, in the situation. Um, and the guys have maybe alluded to this um, earlier on. You know, we're, we're torn perhaps between um, you know, having a constitution which doesn't look like you know, as thick as the Bible, um, you know, but you actually kind of having a constitution which actually is fit for purpose, in which, if we're going to say we want a Scottish constitution to effectively rein in and steer and guide Scotland's military footprint, I think we have questions to ask about precisely what we include in that constitution. The Mongolian experience, I think, in terms of uh, nuclear weapons is incredibly instructive. It shows good practice, extremely civilised, and it shows the, the, the merits and the, the, the possible success of pedestaling anti-nuclear weapons legislation and bringing it in front of the international community. Ireland's experience, I think, is incredibly instructive because it shows that we cannot be complacent about checks and balances. I've often referred that term, checks and balances. Ireland continues to be lauded as a good global citizen. The Irish government continues to articulate the rhetoric of neutrality, that it has been a, played a pivotal part in many of the dispiriting excesses and mistakes that we've seen post 9-11. Again, I think the framers of a Scottish constitution, if they seriously are going to think about how we can guide and restrain Scotland's international footprint, should bear these experiences in mind. I've spoken for a bit too long, I apologise, that's me for this Okay, thank you very much. Um, questions in the remaining time? <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, it's 10 to 9, and while I thank all the speakers for their contribution, I came here tonight from Glasgow thinking this was meant to be as advertised a public discussion. Mm -hmm. We now have 10 minutes, um, and you know I think that there's obviously a lot of issues here to be said, so I just wanted to preface with that. But the second thing I wanted to say was that um, I'm someone who has been um, working in, in the anti-poverty field for many, many years, and um, I'm also currently doing um, in the third year of uh, my PhD at the University of the West of Scotland when I look at the potential for human rights culture in Scotland, and particularly an anti-poverty human rights culture in Scotland. So my question is addressed to Mr Goldberg. I was absolutely shocked, um, and you probably get emotion in my voice, because I am absolutely shocked um, that you think that economic, social and cultural rights are something, quote, and I'm quoting you from what you said, that we can actually do if we want. So my specific question is, are you advocating then that an independent Scotland should only pay attention to about half of the rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, are you advocating then that the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which is derived from that declaration, and which the UK government ratified in 1966 and refused to bring into domestic law since then, should be repealed or ignored um, by the independent Scotland, depending on whether or not um, we are successor state to that treaty? Uh, are you, um, you seem to be suggesting that, that we be one of the few countries, but if not the only country in the developed world, that would repeal a piece of human rights legislation. There has been comments that the UK government said to repeal the Human Rights Act, um, and, and the comment has been that they would be the only country to do that. Are you saying that Scotland should be the only country in the world, in the event of that not happening, to repeal a piece of international human rights legislation? Because if you're saying that economic, social and cultural rights are something we can do with what we want, also begs the question of who we are, because I think the poor would want that, um, then that seems to be what you're saying, so I'd, I'd welcome your comments. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting anything like that. All, all, my, all I'm suggesting is that there's a difference between what goes into a constitution and what is dealt with by treaty and what is dealt with by statute law. And that it is not necessary for all things at all times to be governed by the constitution. That we can have different approaches to the question of what we include in the constitution and what we include in other areas. Now, The, the difference between them is at what level they sit in terms of their entrenchment, so how can they be changed, and in terms of their enforcement, so how do they fit in the hierarchy of law. Um, certainly there are many perfectly respectable democratic states which do not incorporate socio-economic and cultural rights at a constitutional level. Um, I would regard that if that were to be a choice to be made <coughs> as perhaps a suboptimal choice from my own personal point of view, but nevertheless a perfectly legitimate choice that a, a state constituting its state itself could choose to make. I'm not advocating it. I'm saying it would be a perfectly legitimate choice to, as to what to put in the Constitution. In the same way as some people might get incredibly emotional about 
a monarchy or a republic, or might get very, very adamant about whether the state is secular or whether it recognizes some sort of religious heritage. That different states have different approaches to these, these issues. Um, and a constitution, uh, as I see it, is, is fundamentally about, first and foremost, about pre preventing the government-state distinction from collapsing. It prevents the government of the day from being able to control and manipulate the permanent institutions of the state. Um, so as long as that's in place, and I think that the absolute baselines here are the European Convention and parliamentary and judicial structures being embedded in the Constitution, provided that's met, then you can build onto that all sorts of other things. But the problem is that we disagree about what those are. The European Convention of Socio-Economic and Cultural Rights, yes, I agree. The UK government uh, signed it. It's never been brought, brought, brought oh, in. It's the International Covenant. Sorry. The International Covenant, sorry. Um, I know there's a, the, the European one of, uh, of 1961. But um, what, a, what a future Scottish government and parliament would choose to do with those things, I think, could, could arguably up, be up to them. When I wrote in my book, A Model Constitution for Scotland, I included socio-economic and cultural rights. I think there's a strong case for including them at the level, at least, of principles that are binding politically on Parliament, and then leaving it up to Parliament to determine how to enforce those principles through um, legislation. And I, I think that's probably the most likely and sensible outcome. All I was suggesting is that it's not necessary from day one, from a, the point of view of the core, core purposes of the Constitution, that these things be entrenched. So I'll just come back very briefly because I don't yeah. know if people are waiting to find I have read your book, and I don't think that you did have to put really economic, social and cultural rights. You quote the European Convention of Human Rights as one of the basis for the, for the, the a, a constitution, thereby recognising the importance of human rights. But the European Convention of Human Rights only deals with civil and political rights. So what you're actually seeing here is there are two tiers of rights. There is one more important than the other. Civil and political rights should be respected, but economic, social and cultural rights are an aspiration or an option. There is nothing more fundamental than the right to food. It was denied every day to people in this country. So I'm not going to go to lectures and say people are coming in, but the Constitution of Independent Scotland that does not deal with economic, social, and cultural rights and the indivisibility of human rights, which was the spirit of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which civilised nations are meant to adhere to, is actually would not be a, be a, be a, a, a constitution for a civilised country. That's why I would like to... Okay, can, I, can I come back to that? Just a Because I, I don't want to get into an argument about this because I, I think that the, the point is that one can have D different views on this. Uh, I would agree about the, the right to food. The question is simply, should that be constitutionalized as a constitutional right? And there might be good arguments for doing so, by the way. And I'm not saying that there are not. All I'm saying is that that is a conversation which, which needs to be had, particularly when it comes to enforceability. I think one of the differences is that I think there are, there are rights that, that can be more easily enforced through judicial means, and there are other rights which need uh, translation into administrative policy. And that might be, it's, it, it, there's a big overlap, and, 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 and I recognize that, but I think that might be a line of division between, those, between how rights are framed and whether they are framed in... Um, a judicially enforceable sense or in a politically uh, obliging sense. Can we go on? Yes, yes and then. Yes, I think it's more about not about the conversation we need to have, is how the demand might be made in this space where that sort of discussion is closed down. And I think what Neil said about starting from the state, not the constitution, is essential to that, rather than dwelling on the state as a constitution, which distracts things. So I think starting from the state draws your thoughts down to the state of society and the economy where you identify different groups, or you might say classes, including workers, but also including people in poverty, including women, including these different groups at the wrong end of the power holding line. And the question is for me, not about whether it should be communal programmatic, but how we make it communal programmatic. 
against that sort of power. I mean, I think that's where we should be starting from. I mean, I know there's not much time, but I suppose I think my one question is I broadly agree with Neil that it's about trying to find a way to change the Constitution so that it allows for and favours the, the power of those oppressed groups, exploited groups, to be heard. Um, but I'm sceptical about whether we should focus on those certain groups. Or my question is, should we focus and specify certain groups, or should we just sort of abstract and say there are certain groups in our society without a voice through the Constitution? How then could we constitute or reconstitute Scotland so that those groups, those in poverty, working people, women, whatever, have a process through which they can change or alter um, the state? And I suppose I'm, I'm not hearing an answer on that. Um, might we be able to identify a group in the abstract that might have the certain amount of power to do that? Um, if so, how can we ensure that they have the voice, or if not the voice themselves, the advocates to make that case? I think there are groups like Poverty Alliance which find a way to do it out with the Constitution, but couldn't we do it within the Constitution? Likewise, trade unions need to have a constitutional rule. Um, and the third one is, well, they, they tend to be without the power and also without the means to, to assert their claim. How can we make sure that the Constitution... There's a, been a bit of debate about whether the Constitution can enable the sort of institutional change we're talking about. Why don't we just say, what are the material and institutional conditions and laws that we can put in place to ensure that when these groups assert their power, they, they're sort of able to, to, to make um, the, the, the pro progress they want? I mean, I, yeah, I suppose that's sort of where I, I'm frustrated we don't have all that much time, but it's a, a sort of interesting question. I, can I say two brief comments on that? I am um, perfectly happy to, to have like an abstract comment about oppressed groups or, or groups to be looked at. The trouble is that uh, nowadays that tends to be everybody except class. Everything is included in that except questions of social class. And that would be what would happen here, I think. So in a sense, talking about trade unions is talking as a surrogate for talking about the working class and its role and the fact that it's the biggest group in society, although people don't think it exists and all this kind of stuff. That's why. The second thing, is actually, that, and this is partly do with doing away with the current two union laws, is one of the things that can't do legally at the moment is workers and trade unions can't take action in defense of groups who are not organized, for example, law things like the bedroom tax. If you do away with the thing that says you can only take action on something that directly affects you, workers could take action in the defense of, 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 of groups in poverty who, are, who are find it difficult to organize their own way and at least could support them in a far better way. So I think that is partly feeding into the kind of issues you're dealing with, but clearly this is a gigantic subject <laughs> for discussion. Yeah, yes. Sorry, can I come back to that question just for a second? Quick, quickly, yes, sir, but I do want to get a okay. few more in, so go ahead. Yeah, um, we could go a little more, I think, if they don't kick us out. So. <laughs> you see, I think this is a really interesting point, and, and probably in some ways a much more interesting discussion than what is our wish list of rights that we can put in a constitution. How, what is the political constitution? What is the, what is the policy-making process? And how does that determine the outcomes? And maybe that's a better way of doing it than prescribing <coughs> a set of rights in the Constitution, not you know, an extensive set of rights in the Constitution that could well be divisive. We could disagree over what those are, but maybe we can agree more about a process of how we get to what substantive outcomes we achieve. And here, I think, I, I gave this, this presentation um, at Sciences Po about non-elite representation. And this is, I think, something that's completely lacking from our institutional thought about constitution building over the last two centuries. The election and the legitimation of office holders by a competitive struggle for people's vote has entirely overruled pre-modern forms of office allocation, such as functional representation through things like guilds and collegia and trade unions, and the lot. The, the use of random lot. Now, some work has been doing on uh, is being done on this at a very theoretical level. It's not really filtered through to practical policy proposals. But I think it would be very interesting to see. Let, let's take our set of European Convention rights, and let's have our parliamentary chamber, and let's put another chamber in place that is selected by random lot. Because random lot doesn't favour the rich, the powerful, the educated, the articulate. It doesn't favour anybody. And therefore it favours the majority. Um, and if that chamber were to given a, be given an initiative, be given um, 
the power to veto legislation, maybe these trade union laws would never have got passed in the first place. Maybe it would shift who governments are responsible to. We're now, I think, at, at the very extreme end of thinking about the possible. Um, I do not think it is likely that that sort of institution will come out of a constitution-making process in this environment yet. But, but, but it, I think that might be an interesting way of thinking about it in terms of how do we structure the institutions of governance so that we have a process of governance which ex includes those who are currently excluded, rather than trying to predetermine outcomes. Yes, please. Uh, I, I noticed that our two speakers in the centre kept using their hands like this. It was like a tornado. And that's how I feel like using my hands. This is such a difficult subject to give the nitty gritty. And I'm just going to come from an overall part. Talking about a virtuous nation. Now we're going to your friend, Benjamin Franklin. The Americans went through this situation. You might be Jefferson, you might be sitting there, and you might be John Adams, trying to get consensus. But I found that I needed tonight what information you were giving me. I needed your four voices because I am not coming from the nitty gritty and I'm getting some of the nitty gritty and I got it from the lady who spoke just now but I needed the four of you to lay this out in a way that made me think of in my case the United States because I lived there for 30 years they did this they did a constitution and it's fascinating to read about how it came about. And it's, when I'm, I'm just I'm just reading the book about it, I'm just li listening to you for I'm thinking, this could be that constitution making in the process. We will get there. It's a long process, and there are going to be the articulation of a very particular minority, not minority, because I'm right on your side. I don't know how to get there. I don't know how to achieve the this equality but it's been an inspiring evening for me just to listen to all this and try and make some kind of sense and I keep going back to the Jim Franklin <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much thank you, thank you very much are there, are there questions that you would like to get in yes please we'll just put in a point. Um, no, Norway which I would see is a, in some ways a model for Scotland got its constitution in 1817 before any of these modern um, conventions existed. And uh, it seems to me to respect human rights rather more than most people do. And that constitution of 1817 allowed Norway to take its independence in 1905 in the substances of that time. So, just a comment. Yes, please. Um, have you thought of any way that about who is going to interpret and guide the constitution itself. So who is going to interpret it? Yeah, because going back to the states as well, it seems the constitution is there and there's some things that are quite obvious, but how it's interpreted at the federal and state level is another matter. Mm -hmm. So have you thought about what could be helpful in terms of so Let's see, I, 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 began, I, I, I began to draw the outlines just of my own ideas in terms of having uh, at least maybe there would be different ways in which, it may, because in the United States it's, it's held to be uniquely the domain of the, the Supreme Court that is supposed to interpret the Constitution, but also the, the, the law, you know, under the law you have, you, they, they're supposed to interpret it, they're supposed to use the Constitution when making laws, but they don't, they don't always, you know, and so what happens when they do? And the problem in the United States uh, is that in this notion of standing, so, for example, if you, uh, you know, are, uh, if you are, are uh, you, in other words, in order to, to bring suit to challenge the constitutionality of the law, you have to be negatively affected by that, and then you have to go through this incredibly arduous process of maybe, perhaps, getting up 
to the level of the Supreme Court in which this rule or law is ruled unconstitutional. <laughs> but it's very difficult, and the states can do many things that, that are clearly unconstitutional, but it's so difficult to get, you know, for someone to get standing to have it challenged. Uh, I thought of this, when I was speaking about this commission, I thought of a commission that could oversee the lawmaking process to make sure that it was done in conformity with the Constitution, somewhat like the Conseil Constitutionnel in, in France, which has to look at a law before it, it, it's passed to make sure it conforms to the Constitution, um, and, uh, and to make sure that the procedure is done properly in a constitutional way. And so that would make a help, at least help to prevent you know, of unconstitutional laws from being passed. But maybe some slip through the way, and maybe they don't catch it. So maybe there has to be some kind of Supreme Court or, you know, to, to that can able, to can, once it is passed, that, can, that, that might be able to challenge it. So, uh, but I think that with Scotland as a, re, as a relative, you know, 5.5 million people, it's not, it doesn't, it won't have 50 states. Uh, you know, it'll have one state, and, you know, within, you know, and, and uh, with 5 million people, it's much smaller than many, U.S. states, it's doable. You know, it's a, it's Scotland is a scale in which many of these things are possible with simple mechanisms, not just these horrendously complex, often very ineffective ones. So again, uh, these these questions are, you will be. I mean, I've put in a couple of ideas, but it, it needs to be worked out. But what I but I, but, but on a on a positive note, I think it I think it can be done well in a, in a country the size of Scotland with the the good people that it has in the population. And to pick up briefly on the on the Norwegian comment, yep. I think Sweden has a really good example of that kind of pre-legislative constitutional scrutiny. So that would be a good example to look up. Okay. So you first, and then and yeah, go ahead, go ahead, and then you after. Yeah. yeah it's probably an ill-informed, you know, not very informed, yeah. but I'm becoming more sorted this evening. <laughs> but when do you see the constitution will actually be put into place, and who? Eventually, does that? Is that it really that's 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 so <laughs> up in the air. And we yes. we in this we we as this group want to put the ideas out there. We'd like to to put out some some principles that will hopefully be adopted. And now uh, there will be a white paper that comes okay. out in uh, November, and they have apparent as from what we sort of understand, they 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 will hopefully have some principles regarding. The you know, the constitutional principles, or you know, uh, uh, at least some kind of commitment to a written constitution. We don't know the content of that, and so what? But we would like to get the discussion so that maybe we can help inform that content. And once we see that, we can act. We can, we as a group can w uh, act upon it to try to help push the process along. But we're you know, we have no mandate from the Scottish government. We are you know, private citizens trying to uh, trying to. To, 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 to affect change, but you know it's it's one of these things. All we can do is is do our best to, to help to, to start an informed debate and to, and to get and to get these get these things moving. Hopefully, in the correct in the is right. Is there way. a recent constitution that we can look at and to see how they went about it? Is Iceland is a good example, perhaps? Yes, we there's numerous constitutions. They about it there's numerous constitutions even online. Yes. I mean the German constitution. I mean. Mongolian, um, mm. so yes, I mean, there's there's numerous examples mm -hmm. uh, which are readily accessible. So, can I just get a quick bit of information in response to that very quickly? There are, met, there are several groups who have set, have set themselves up to look at different constitutions. So, I know there's a lot of work being in here, but I'm sure you'll acknowledge you're not the only group who's doing this. Oh, sure. so there are other groups out there where you can actually look and see which one is closest oh, to your heart. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not all of them are online yet, but there are various groups going here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, please, yes. I was just going to make the point that, uh, you know, that the issue about poverty, the issue about um, talking about Scotland being much fairer, or that we can we can envision this better society, and taking all of the points that you've made tonight, and I know the work that you do, the Constitution doesn't necessarily guarantee that. I mean, we're talking about the American Constitution, which is the most unequal society in the world, so why would you copy any of that? Well, why would we pay attention to the fact that that's the answer for everything? It's not. And does it also mean that some of the countries, and I personally am more and more persuaded to look at the Nordic countries mm -hmm. in terms of, of a much better management of how we all, how we all live? And I'm not constitutional lawyer, but does that mean that their constitution, so if, we're, if we use that as a guideline, do we just look you know, to the, the welfare system from Denmark, the education system from Finland, 
the, and we, we There's a lot of that. places from which you and can draw inspiration, can, certainly. So the point is that I think it's, it's not about the Constitution uh, per se, but I mean, I absolutely am hooked on, on getting a written Constitution. Right. I'm absolutely convinced in my heat. I think <laughs> we need it because, and, and, and particularly for the, for the referendum coming up, because I think it actually is a kind of marker. It might not be right, but it gives people a chance to say, I mean, the Icelandic constitution, I understand, opens with everybody, the residents of Iceland will be treated equally. Now, that, for me, that's quite a strong statement. And it determines then what the what politicians and what policies are made at the back of that, because we've declared that that's what we want to support. But it is a big mess in everybody's head of how we get this. Very quickly, and then, and then Neil, it, it just really depends on how it's done, and that's where we're so we, you know, we're just embarking on, you know, uh, just embarking on this process. It's going to be, and and but I think at the end, if the process can be done to where we have a very desirable result that does. But, but, you know, there are good constitutions and bad constitutions, and ones that are adaptable and not, and ones that are rigid and flexible, and, you know, so, um, uh, so you know, it just, it just depends on how it's done. Yeah. I think we have to be quite careful about looking at the Nordic model, actually. One thing that's happening in Scandinavian countries is inequality is increasing at an exponential rate. Poverty is increasing, and that's in spite of our constitutions. You know, the new liberalism has not stopped, you know, at, at, models in the Scandinavian countries is pressing on there. Mm -hmm. And I think you'd be aware of this the last 10 years there's been a substantial increase in this. Now, you know, so that, that says you're right, the constitution in itself doesn't guarantee anything. All I think it can do in a sense is set the rules and allow people something to appeal to in order to fight for their interests. Uh, and in this, in this case the, the vast majority of them. <coughs> I mean the American constitution is a monstrous pre-capitalist thing, you know, which, which actually people do argue to appeal to it to fight for certain things. People did appeal to it in terms of rights for for, for, for black people in the system, so I argue that the amendments they made. It's possible to use constitutions, but you have to understand the limits. And therefore, I, think, I don't think any of you are starry eyed about that. The constitution will actually do it allow, but it does actually get a, a set of rules that you can use in the kind of social struggles that will inevitably be followed. Can I add one more thing to that? Uh, just to uh, really very, very much uh, concurring with both perspectives. Um, you know, Norway is often seen as, as a good model, but with my kind of defence head on, um, Norway last year, uh, over three billion pounds in, in arms sales. Um, Norwegian government uh, looking at uh, tightening legislation on how m uh, many weapons uh, Norway sells also makes uh, components for nuclear weapons. So, totally correct, we should not be starry-eyed. A constitution gar um, guarantees nothing at the end of the day. The cornerstone, the bedrock, is strong, responsible government. Uh, John, please. I, I, I think it's important. I, I agree with avoiding being starry eyed. And I, I think the problems. No. <laughs> no. Uh, and I think we've probably all been guilty a little bit of that tonight, in the sense that uh, I, I get a, 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 a view that uh, people who have written constitution is highly desirable or desirable to some degree. Uh, and I've got to commend it, and I would agree with all of that. Um, but there's nothing in the political process right now that uh, would require the, the Scottish government to implement a, a written constitution uh, after, if there was a yes vote in the referendum. Uh, and perhaps uh, the panelists would like to talk about that. Because I do feel it's terribly important that there is some specific legal commitment. Now, I understand the difficulty, because how can a devolved administration commit its successors? Uh, and it's not the British tradition to commit its successors. But in this particular case, perhaps there is a moral case for doing so. How would like to come to that? Okay. Um, I, I think this is where the interim platform comes in. Um, my position on this has shifted. I, I, I used to be of the view, which was the view advocated by Neil McCormick, that the text of a constitution should be negotiated in advance of the referendum, and it should be put to the people in a referendum, and then when you vote, you're voting for a choice between two constitutional orders, the existing one or the one that is proposed to you. I can see the advantage now of the fact that if you're going to have a constitutional process, this needs to be a longer process than that sort of framework will allow for. It needs to be a more inclusive process than that sort of timescale will allow for. 
um, particularly given the current polarization of the debate. If, if we've been in a different situation, that might not be the case. But I think what we can do is to say, the Scottish government is advocating that you vote for a new state. It has a moral obligation to set out the basic foundational structures of that state in a way that is ultimately defensive, that protects you against the risk of dictatorship, that protects you against the risk that the government that wins in the first elections is going to keep on winning. And I, I see that as a perfectly proper thing for the Scottish Government to commit to ahead of the referendum in the white paper. And my understanding is that there will be a constitutional platform that will provide for that transition. I think the key thing that we haven't had clear assurance on in a, in a public announcement is that that constitutional platform will itself be entrenched. And that constitutional platform will contain within it a timetable, a process, baselines for the development of a permanent constitution. And I would feel much more reassured if that were the case, because then you're not voting for a blank check, you're voting for baselines, processes, timetables, and I think we can all feel a lot more, even though we might still argue about what's in the detail of what comes out of that, we'd all feel very, very reassured by that and by the transitional arrangements being entrenched. Other questions before we adjourn? Well, I want to thank you all very much for coming and contributing, and uh, it's just been it's been a, a very productive evening. And I want to thank you all for. Thank you for you and the panelists for having such a session.